Good morning and welcome to the worship service for July 12th at the Mount Vernon First United Methodist Church in Mount Vernon, Washington. Glad to have you with us again this morning. I just have one announcement before we enter into our time of worship. Uh, tomorrow, July 13th, Monday, we'll have another chance to celebrate a birthday with one of our beloved congregation members. This time it's Barbara Jackson, and this time we'll also be uh, doing that celebration at the church. Uh, so we invite you to come at 9.45. We'll be gathering in the back of the church to get our cars ready, and then we'll drive around to the front of the church where Barbara and her daughter Kip will be, and we'll uh, drive by first in one direction and then the other so that people on both sides of the vehicles will get a chance to wave and, and greet Barbara. Of course, we'll stay in our cars when we are greeting Barbara, and there'll be no physical contact. We will keep a... A significant dif distance between the cars and Barbara, but uh, if you haven't had a chance to do this yet, I really encourage you to come out if you can. We have found that uh, the people in the cars are having almost as much fun and are being lifted up almost as much as the person whose birthday it is. So we hope that you will come and join us tomorrow at 945 for that celebration of Barbara Jackson's birthday. So I'd like to bring us into our time of worship this morning by sharing a responsive prayer reading. So I hope you got the uh, prayer in our Thursday email. And uh, if you need to pause the video to, to retrieve that, please go ahead and do that. There's two sections. I will read them both, but I'll pause in between and invite you to join me for the second part. And this reading comes from a book titled um, The Complete Book of Christian Prayer. Um, a odd name, since of course there can be no complete book of Christian prayer, but it is a very comprehensive one. This prayer comes from page 216 in that book. Let us pray. Dear God, I would like to become a little child, and rest my soul in you. I'm tired of the loneliness, tired of the struggle. I want to surrender, but, but I don't know how. You see, I, I have this problem of being an adult. I belong to the generation which makes decisions, plans, works, accepts responsibility takes pride in being independent. Adults are supposed to manage their lives. They are concerned with owning things and making things happen, and they do not like to look small or foolish. Dear God, for a long time I've been living at the center of a world which has prevented me from entering the kingdom of heaven. Please join me now. Father God, Mother God, show me how to become your child. I'm aware of the advice Jesus gives. He does not say that we should remain in infancy. He says that we should become as little children. This tells me that I need to know the futility of independence before I can let it go. It is a letting go which is difficult. I know you are there, waiting to give yourself to me, but I'm afraid to commit myself. Please help me to loosen this grip on my pride so that I can hold out my arms to you and be enfolded in your love. In Christ's sweet and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's now continue our entrance into worship by joining in the hymn, uh, Honor and Praise, which comes out of our uh, The Faith We Sing hymn book. And if you have one of those at home, you can find it in the music for it on page 2018.
So this morning we'll have two readings from Scripture, each from a uh, prophet, both uh, um, speaking in the uh, eighth, eighth century before the Christian era. So as we begin with the first reading, which comes from Amos, I invite you to listen to the language that comes from God, according to the prophet. And God is announcing a very hard word to Israel. And I invite you to just be aware, to notice, if you can take this as a word to you as well, to us as well, how you feel as a member of the chosen people receiving this word. Let's listen to the reading from the prophet Amos. This reading is Amos chapter 5, verse 21 through 24 from the Voice Bible. The Lord God says, I hate, I totally reject your religious ceremonies and have nothing to do with your solemn gatherings. You can offer me whole burnt offerings and grain offerings, but I will not accept them. You can sacrifice your finest, fattest young animals as a peace offering, but I will not even look up. And stop making that music for me. It's just noise. I will not listen to the melodies you play on the harp. Here's what I want. Let justice thunder down like a waterfall. Let righteousness flow like a mighty river that never runs dry. So I want to share a few things out of one of my favorite resources. It's a 12-volume set called The New Interpreter's Bible. It's a detailed commentary on all of the uh, biblical texts. And this is what it says at the introduction to the book of Amos. There is almost unanimous agreement that the book of Amos is the earliest of the prophetic books. As such, it marks the beginning of a unique tradition in the history of religion. Prophecies of the approaching end of the existence of God's people based upon God's judgment of them for failing to live according to the divine standards. The tradition continues from Amos through the books of Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, and early parts of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then the tradition ends. Each of these later works takes up the message of takes up and reasserts the unacceptable message first announced in the book of Amos. But the message of Amos has no predecessors that we can identify. So unacceptable in the sense that this is not what we want to hear. We have a terrible time hearing this word. And it brings us into what I plan to do throughout the summer here. And, and that is to uh, kind of have a look across the biblical text, at the God that is portrayed there, um, and the characteristics. It's something that we often find ourselves referring back to, and it has everything to do with how we understand not only the Bible and our faith, but the world that we live in. So. So here's a, a bit more of the reading in this uh, bit more of the reading from the New Interpreter's Bible. Once we note the typical ways the Old Testament has been used across the years in our understanding of God and our relationship to God, that is, prior to the 19th century, the reasons for the relative neglect of Amos become clear. This is not a text that you have probably often heard, with the exception of little bits, including the bit that I'm going to share today. But I want that to be in a context. Both Jewish and Christian interpreters typically sought messages of comfort and hope in the Old Testament. And there is little of that to be found in Amos. 
as a source of ethical teaching the fact that the book contains only one exhortation with a faint promise made it less appealing than other books, which are filled with promises. It will take Amos's announcement of the impending exile of Israel, the northern kingdom of, of uh, Israel, interpreted by him as the death of God's people, to be one of history's most profound insights into the true nature of the human dilemma and God's surprising, even shocking ways of dealing with it. Amos speaks of death. He does not know yet of resurrection, about which the last line of the judgment prophets spoke. But he was the first to announce that Israel must die. The beginning of a new act in the Old Testament story of redemption. Now we tend to um, speak a bit uh, freely, sometimes perhaps even cavalierly, about that uh, call to dying in life as we will then later live in death. And we think about that often in relatively small ways that we might have to give up some things like we do during Lent that we would like to do or like to have as a concession to um, trying to follow that warning about um, greed that we find in so many places, including in the books of the prophets. But Amos lays it out very powerfully. You heard that Amos reveals God just sharing with the people a disgust, a tiredness, a, a, a being sick and fed up with actions that have no heart to them. He, when he says, I don't want your offerings, stop that music, it's just noise to my ears, we should hear in all of that a repudiation not of the plans that had been laid out so long ago, of how to live in community together and how to live in relationship with God, but rather a repudiation of the reality of how those uh, messages, those early messages about relationship and about heart and about soul have been turned into checklists and uh, tasks to be completed so that then Folks could get on with things that they really wanted to do. And he's speaking at least as powerfully to the priests and religious leaders as he is to the people themselves. When all the right things are done, without any heart or any soul, God is saying they just make him sick. That they're just... Can you imagine the, the frustration of offering, offering the, the pathway to a beautiful, rich, deep relationship and have it simply turned into a system of checklists um, done more to prevent or to hedge one's bets against negative outcomes excuse me, then, then out of love. What God wants, of course, is love. And I just love the image that Amos uses of, of justice rolling down like a mighty river. Mighty river that, uh, that seems to have no end in that, that um, prepares to just push out anything in its past. It's a constant, a powerful pressure to wash away everything that we want to hold on to, trusting instead that what we need, 
will be provided in both the amount and at the time that it is needed. Let's listen to the second reading now, which comes from the prophet Micah. This next reading comes from Micah chapter 6, verse 6 through 9 from the Voice Bible. Israel asks, What should I bring into the presence of the Eternal One to pay homage to the God Most High? Should I come into his presence with burnt offerings, with year old calves to sacrifice? Would the Eternal be pleased by thousands of sacrifice rams, by ten thousand swollen rivers of sweet olive oil? Should my offer my oldest son for my wrongdoing, the child of my body to cover the sins of my life? Micah replies, No. He has told you, mortals, what is good in his sight. What else does the Eternal ask of you but to live justly and to love kindness and to walk with your true God in all humility? So I hope you recognize in there uh, somewhat of a change of tone. It's still very much a God that is unhappy with the chosen people. But at least in this portion of the message delivered through Micah, it's... It's a little less threatening, a little less angry. God seems a little less frustrated, a little less ready to just end this whole human being business. But we still hear in there the rejection of offerings made with no repentant heart behind them. Offerings made even with no joy in the offering. Offerings made more to be seen making the offerings than truly out of love and respect for God. Israel asks some, some questions. What should I do? Should I basically follow the rules and offer burnt offerings with year-old calves to sacrifice, which no small thing to give up a calf or whatever you were able to afford. And, and works his way towards greater and greater levels of offering. Would the eternal be pleased by thousands of sacrificial rams? by 10,000 swollen rivers of sweet olive oil. So Mike has turned that river thing around, and now it's people trying to offer a river as a way to appease God, as a way to demonstrate maybe both their, their wealth and uh, to make it appear that they are so loving of God that they would give up so much. And then finally, should I offer my oldest son for my wrongdoing, the child of my body, to cover the sins of my life? The, the old, old um, ultimate offering of the firstborn son changed through this experience of Abraham and Isaac in that pivotal story so that the son is not literally sacrificed like a, like a bull on a fire, but given up the, in Israel, the firstborn son still belongs to God. And most parents have the experience of taking their very young son up to the temple to be blessed and named and um, to offer them to God later. Fully expecting and hoping and, and believing that that son is going to be coming back home with them at the end of their time in Jerusalem. That God will pardon their son from that life of service in an official capacity. 
But still the first son belongs to God in a sense. But not as, as a means of offsetting or redeeming the parent for their sins. But ultimately, God answers the question of Israel saying, no. The prophet answers, saying, no, God has told us mortals what is good. And what God asks of us through that whole sacrificial system, but also through the expectations and the hopes of God um, for, for each of our lives, He's just simply to live justly and to love kindness and to walk with God in true humility. We go back to our opening prayer to be able to give up our desire, our, our training to be in charge, to make the decisions. doesn't mean we never make decisions. But ideally it does mean that before making big decisions individually and certainly before making them as a part of the body of Christ, that we would first at least check in with God and say, Hey God, what do you want? What would you hope for us to do here? It is a challenge, and I think I've said this many times, um, and we see it so blatantly right now in our country. This challenge for us to step away from the controls, from trying to run the machinery of life, to, to to stamp it with our name and our image and our belief, beliefs and, and uh, desires about what, what we want to be right, which usually are things that keep us in power, in command, in control, in favor of that humility that says, It'd probably be a mistake to put me in charge of everything. Being human, my sight and my insight will both be short, where God's is unending. That when we truly walk with our God in all humility and love kindness, it's really hard to imagine us those of us who are relatively healthy, who have no actual medical need to avoid wearing a mask, to come up with some scheme to get out of wearing masks, just simply because we don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> I really struggle every week right now because honestly, I'm guessing you're probably tired of hearing about these challenges and what I believe we're called to do as Christians in the midst of these challenges. Because honestly, I'm tired of talking about it. And yet, and yet, the fact that we tire so quickly of a message that calls us to live justly and to live kindly and to live in humility is a pretty powerful indictment of how we live. I know it's true for me. I believe it's true for all of us. May we truly Truly be ready to hear these hard words, not as old world words from a different world, but as words from a living God for the world that God create, creates 
and for all times and all places and all people. Amen and amen. Because we don't gather for our worship now, I often don't really talk about stewardship. I sometimes remember to give thanks for your financial support, um, and we certainly do appreciate that. But these two readings today give us a, a great opportunity to remember what our giving is about. It is so uh, easy and so naturally human. For those of us who, who give and see this as something that is important to us, to, to get separated from the heart in our giving, to get separated from our relationships with one another and with God when we write that check or click on that donation button on the website or however we give. Um, stewardship is the term that we use and it's not just a churchy way to say we need your money it really fits in and exactly with these messages that it is one of the ways that we really get to uh, develop and to to live out a perspective that keeps God at the center of our lives that allows us to see God not as another bill collector or somebody else that we need to pay to keep keep things flowing into our lives but rather as uh, the very source of our own ability to love our own willingness to be concerned about others including people we'll never meet including people we actually don't like don't want to meet but to remember that God calls us to be thankful for the blessings of our lives. To trust that, that that mighty river of justice that flows from God into the world and into our hearts is, is intended to, again, wash away our reluctance, our our uh, task orientation to stewardship. The better for us than to truly, before we write a check, before we go on the website to hit the donate button, to pause and lift up a prayer of thanksgiving for whatever we have, recognizing that it flowed to us in that mighty river of justice when we needed it, usually actually, just before we needed it, although often later than we wanted it, but to then allow our sharing, our giving to be truly a giving back, out of love, out of kindness, out of the desire to truly live with those tender hearts for God, for others in the congregation, for others in the community, and in the world. May our giving truly represent our love, our humility, our relationship with God. Amen. And amen. I just have to uh, step away from my script here for a moment to, to just kind of chuckle at myself and the processes of trying to do this alone. Um, those of you that worship here know how uh, useful it is, how frequently necessary it is for someone else to help remember all the things that need to get done for us to worship in the, in the ways that we are accustomed to. This morning I realized that the, I'd used up the oil in these candles back here yesterday when I first taped all of this worship service, all this week's worship service. And so for the first time ever, I pulled out the 
oil in the back and, and refilled those candles so that at the beginning when I came up and, and before I read the opening uh, response of prayer, I could go over and light those candles um, as a sign of us beginning to worship. And uh, as I just looked at the lighter sitting here where my script also resides, I was reminded that I never did light them. So I'm going to trust that uh, the light in our hearts continues to be bright enough that even without these important symbols, we still know that this has been a time of worship. So with that, I want to enter into a, a time of prayer, invite you into a time of prayer to uh, lift up our joys and our concerns. I know I would want to invite us to pray for the folks in Japan who have been subjected again to extraordinary rainfall that has created flooding and mudslides, resulting in a number of confirmed deaths and many, many other suspected deaths. So let's pray for them, for the uh, folks who are still missing family members, for folks who know that they have lost family members to this natural weather disaster. And for all those who certainly are um, in the middle of this worldwide pandemic are suddenly without a home and another um, obstacle to their sense of security and well-being. And I really want to lift up all the people who are dealing with serious illnesses and injuries, even life-threatening illnesses in this time of pandemic, when there's an overlay of concern about uh, our health for all of us and uh, underlying concern about going into a hospital emergency room or needing a surgery in this time when uh, the risk of infection with a potentially deadly virus is laid on top of all the other risks. So prayers for those folks who, who um, are needing those interventions, are receiving those interventions, that they may receive their treatment um, with care and with all necessary steps being attended to to ensure that the surgeries and the treatments won't introduce new potentially deadly problems, that the medical treatments including surgeries and other forms of treatment might truly be life-saving and life-giving and not life-threatening. And prayers also for the loved ones, the family members who, who aren't able to be there in the room with their dear ones before and after surgeries, may not even be able to be in a hospital waiting room nearby to be able to get the news about an outcome as quickly as possible or are not able to travel to be with loved ones when such needs arise. Prayers for comfort, prayers for insurance, prayers for that connective spirit to, uh, to allow their, the prayers and the, even the presence of those who are being kept at a distance to be felt powerfully by the ones receiving treatment. Uh, prayers for all the folks who have been, um, who, who have lost their employment during this time, and especially for those whose jobs may not be coming back. And prayers for the small business owners who may also be seeing their hopes, their dreams, their life savings being uh, washed away by this pandemic. 
prayers for realistic comfort, prayers for hope, prayers for the bright light of God's love, for all the folks who are dealing with these truly life-altering circumstances. In thinking of the pandemic, I want to lift up all the medical researchers who are working now to try to find some effective um, treatment for this virus, and even better yet, or in addition to that, an effective inoculation that could prevent the infection from even taking a hold in our lives. And, and in that prayer, I want to um, be so bold as to, to pray that in the system of research, in which much of that research is taxpayer funded, that there would be a fairness in the outcome and a care in the outcome so that no medicines get approved that are not truly shown by science to be effective without causing other significant problems and to be affordable and available to all people without regard for their financial status, whether they live in a rural or an urban area, what part of the world they live in. May we truly um, experience not just the exciting news that there is a potential vaccine or a meaningful treatment for this virus, but that that news might be accompanied by or may be enshrouded in the love and the humility that we've been talking about today. Um, so that it truly is available to all safely and affordably. With all of these concerns and with the joys for all of us who woke up this morning, who feel relatively well, who uh, are thankful to be alive today, and thankful for the places we have to shelter in, thankful for our pets and our housemates and others that are helping us get through this difficult time. With all these things and more in mind, let us uh, join together in lifting up the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's join now in the uh, singing of our closing hymn, or at least enjoy Zhang as he shares with us this closing hymn, which I see is really set up to be sung in choir parts, and I'm sorry that we're not able to experience that joy, but um, it is a hymn that is particularly well suited to today's worship service. It's what does the Lord require of you? And again, it's found in the faith we sing. This time, it's number 2174.
So as we prepare now to end our time together, I want to uh, take a moment to thank the uh, Staff Parish Relations Committee, our Human Resources Group, um, and the Church Council, as well as Matt Replier for uh, recognizing the need for some technical support in this process of recording worship. And we thank uh, Matt in particular for, for doing that work for several weeks and in the process um, working out with me a, a good clear way to organize this whole process to produce hopefully a meaningful worship and worship that is uh, easy to watch um, even if sometimes the message itself is hard to hear. So we give thanks to all those folks who have been in support of this and look forward to continuing this this uh, approach so that I can be freed up to do more pastoral work as well. Hear these words as we prepare to go on our way. We are called, we are prepared, we are given the opportunity to demonstrate the kind of relationship we have with one another and with God, moment by moment, day by day. May we truly go out in not just the name, but the spirit and the recognizable likeness of Christ Jesus, that we might show in the world the light of kindness and the tenderness of love where it is perhaps even unexpected. May we truly be Christ for a world that's desperately in need right now for assurance, for faith, for hope, and for justice to truly wash down like the mighty roaring river. It is in Christ's name that we pray, and the people say, Amen. Again, thanks for joining us.